just lift us up to pray for us and to be those people that we can help lift our burdens and to help us, Lord, to lift us up in prayer. I pray that you would be with us today and that you would receive our praise today. I pray that all of us, as we're joining today in um, our social um, video system, that we can praise you through the system, God, all together and magnify your name in all the earth, God. We worship you and we praise you. We adore you, God. We thank you for the snow, even though it makes it a little bit more difficult. We know that this was your will, that you bring it. So we worship you in it, God. In all things, we worship you, Lord. We give you thanks today. And Lord, we are here for you. We worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let us worship him.
worship him. Praise his name forever. Glory to his name. Lord, we want to build our life in you.
answer we could ever give the Lord when he speaks to us is call the Lord right now is wooing the hearts of people whether we are Christians or unbelievers that is the work of the Holy Spirit to draw the hearts of men no one comes to the Father except drawn by the Spirit and as he draws our hearts whether we are far from him or close walking beside him 
It takes an act of our own will to come in compliance with the direction and the will of the Lord around this room and right there in your own homes. Can we just take a moment? Can we posture our hearts? The Holy Spirit, he's a gentleman. He leads us. He does not drive us. He invites us. He does not command to break our, our free will. So today, as God wants to lead us to salvation, wants to lead us into a renewed relationship, into right living, good standing with the Father, we have to say yes. And that answer of yes it changes our destiny. It changes our course of actions and our steps. Father God, I'm asking this morning that in an hour of salvation, in an hour of contemplation, as your Holy Spirit calls upon us, as you lead us, as you draw us, that men and women, young people will answer that call, making this hour an hour of miracle change for all of their lives, saying yes to salvation through Christ receiving your forgiveness, your sacrificial love for us on the cross, that we would be made whole. We thank you, Lord, for your work in us is never done, for our lives as Christians to walk beside you day in and day out, your continual calling in our lives, your leading and prompting of our actions, our conduct, our attitude, and our daily steps. We say yes, Lord, to your will, to your way, to your purposes, that we may leave this old man, this carnal nature behind, pressing toward the mark of the prize of your high calling. We thank you for this. We welcome you. We invite you. And with sincerity of heart, we say yes to your great invite to be like Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning as we transition uh, to our intermission, we're just going to give the Lord thanks one more time. Father, we praise you. We thank you for walking with us throughout our days. We thank you, Lord, that in the hours of difficulty, you are always present for those that are watching that have needs or, or uh, healings or miracles. They are praying. Good morning, and welcome back to our sermon series of the new year that is titled New Year's Essentials for Spiritual Growth. As I get started, I want to take a moment and uh, acknowledge a couple of things, and that is for those of you that endured and attempted to follow us with a live stream this morning in a winter storm, uh, you probably found yourself unsuccessful because our internet provider just simply could not keep up with the demand today. And uh, we are recording the service live right now, and we're going to be uploading that as fast as we can and as soon as internet service will permit us. So we do apologize for the delay, but that was simply out of our hands. It was not a technical difficulty on our end. Of all the times we do drop the ball and make some mistakes occasionally, this was not one of them. <laughs> we thank you for enduring and persevering to receive the word of the Lord. And that's really why we gather to assemble, is to fellowship with one another, encourage one another in Christ, uh, and to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is to us and who he wants us to become in him. And I want to just uh, say thank you, take a moment and recognize uh, offer my appreciation to those who covered all areas of ministry while my family and I were on vacation last week. 
I want to say thank you to Teresa, our office, uh, office manager, uh, for officiating the services, which isn't something that uh, she feels comfortable with, but for officiating our services last week, uh, as well as taking care of all of the weekly logistics that, that are just all behind the scenes. Thank you, Teresa. You did a terrific job. I want to say thank you to the worship team. Guys, you really did a beautiful job last week. Uh, I was in Disney World streaming the service the best that I can, given the fact that there was some also technical difficulties with the Internet provider last week as well, but I was blessed uh, to receive your worship. Thank you for preparing uh, and anointing and just ushering the presence of God so that those who hear the word uh, would be able to receive it with great joy. And last but certainly not least, I want to say thank you to Anthony Herrera for preaching in my absence. What a timely message of encouragement he gave the body of Christ. If you missed that sermon for whatever reason, I want you to go back and stream that uh, it is available for you on our website, as well as Facebook and YouTube accounts. Uh, we bless you in Jesus' name. And again, Anthony, thank you for your faithfulness and your perseverance to just encourage the local church, as well as the church at whole, who would tune in for that message. Aren't we blessed as a church family to have such wonderful servants of Christ in our own family? Isn't he, man? I want you to remember something. This isn't really in my notes, but man, this could preach as a sermon. Um, a church's success is not measured by its attendance. A church's success is truly measured by its commitment of servant leadership within it. And it's, its passion and its commitment to the call of personal discipleship. So you take those two elements and you realize that is greater than the size of a congregation. It talks about the greatest commitment of the heart of people. And just knowing of the faithful servants of Christ that we have right here at New Hope, it certainly allowed me to relax while on my family vacation. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I enjoyed the sunshine. Oh, did I enjoy it. And uh, while I was sitting poolside in 80-degree weather, having full knowledge that you, my beloved, were back here in a winter storm, a tear came to my eye. I think it was joy, <laughs> so, <laughs> and we are in the middle of another winter storm right now, and that tear is back. It makes me want to go back to Florida, where it was gorgeous. All right, our current series uh, addresses the action steps that we, as God's children, need to take faithfully in order for us to really grow beyond where we have gone in our faith. I want, I want you to just consider this for a second. There are, there are reasons why Christians plateau in their walk with Jesus. There are reasons why we have these really hot and powerful, passionate moments in our growth with Christ, but there are reasons why we plateau and just kind of stay status quo. It's not backsliding. It's, it's not walking away from God. It's not sinning according to the flesh. It, it's just not growth exponentially in our spirit. It's not fruitful in fact, it can actually feel a bit bewildering and discouraging because really it just feels like we're going through the mechanics and the motion. There are reasons for this. And we're talking about in our series essentials that are needed and required in us to continue our spiritual growth and development. And we're talking about action steps that we as individuals need to take in order for our faith to grow beyond the plateau in order for us to grow beyond where we've been and to go somewhere we've not been yet, we're probably going to look at these four topics we've discussed over this month and really examine which ones are, are areas of need in our walk with Christ and which ones are strong in our, our walk with Christ. So let me just kind of give a quick update. I know we took a week off last week as Anthony brought the word in my absence, so let me catch you up to speed as to what we've discussed thus far. To date, we've discussed three of the four essentials that are necessary for spiritual growth. In our first week, we discussed the reality that if we want to grow in our spiritual life, then we're going to have to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, that might sound quite rudimentary for you, but really what we did was we fleshed out the difference between being a confessing Christian and being a cross-carrying disciple. There can be a difference. And not everyone who believes that Jesus is a good prophet or the Son of God or that the Bible is, a, is God's word, not all of them have committed their lives to following Christ 
as his true disciples. If not, that's an area of stagnation which will lead to a plateau and eventually will question, is this real? Number two, in our second week, we talked about the need to develop a daily routine for devotional growth. Now, in that message, we discussed four steps to building a personal devotional life of our own. If you missed that week, or this is an area of need in your life, I want you to go back and stream that week and hope that God will bless you and encourage you as you grow in your devotional life. Our third week together, we talked about how important it is to build community through regular fellowship with God's people. In other words, God created us for connectivity and relationships. It's unnatural for us to be isolated. In fact, this whole COVID experience has caused quite a few problems in people, and it goes far beyond the physical health and touches emotional health and spiritual health. And, uh, and mental health. All of these areas are, are just kind of compounding as a result of the continued absence from the connectivity of relationships that mean something. As Christians, God designed it so that we would be fitly joined together with other believers being part of the living organism called the body of Christ. And when the arm is missing, the body knows. When the head is missing, the body cannot function, right? And so each member is needed in that body. COVID, no doubt, of all of its impacts, has really impacted the regular continuity of fellowship among believers. And I believe that area of the church has been hit the hardest. Over time, distances, uh, distances can cause relationships to grow cold. And it takes our commitment to those relationships to ensure that we're maintaining them and nurturing them, and it becomes harder the more absence we see. So in week three, we discussed the biblical imperative as well as the personal benefits that Christians receive when we connect into the body of Christ through regular fellowship. Today, we're going to conclude our series by discussing a fourth essential that is really necessary if we are going to grow in our faith. So if we're going to grow in our faith beyond what we've already experienced in our lives, number four, we're going to have to commit to service of other people. We're going to have to learn to serve other people faithfully. That's true. If we're really going to grow beyond the plateau of Christendom, we're going to have to understand whom God is trying to develop us to become. Jesus called people to follow him so that he could make them into something profitable for his father's kingdom. That's been our pretext all throughout our message. It's found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Let me read it to you in the New International Version. Do you remember that call of Jesus to the first disciples? It's right here in our text. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus spent three years with these men and others like them. And in this time, he pounded something into their head. And when I say he pounded it into their head, I, I don't mean this uh, deliberately. I mean, he did this through ministry and persuasion and through personal example. He taught them this, that the greatest among you is the one who serves. And he'd look at them and he'd teach them another lesson. The greatest among you is the one who serves. And then he would teach them through another miracle. The greatest among you is the one who serves. And that was so counterculture to anything that they had been taught. So this morning, I want you to re repeat and fill in this sentence. The greatest among you is the one who serves. Now, in just three sentences, you were able to learn something that took three years of Jesus' disciples. But it's one thing to learn it academically, to be able to recite it. It's quite another thing to learn it through humility. The disciples, much like all of us, found greatness in many things. But serving other people, putting other people before them, placing themselves in a place of humility and honoring the needs of others, 
well, that just didn't come natural to them. The problem is Jesus, he called them to leave their old way of life. He called them to leave their old man at the water, their nets and their, and their fishing lives, you know, just making a living, just getting by, surviving. And he called them to leave that behind in order to see what God would do in their lives and what God would make of them. Remember, come and follow me and I'll make you something. Perhaps the number one reason why many Christians do not serve others it's because they've never really made that connection that we discussed in our very first week. That Jesus has called us to become his disciples, not just a confessing believer. There's a significant difference here. More than Christians, more than a church attender. Going to church won't make us any more followers of Christ or disciples of Christ than going through a drive through would make you a hamburger, right? It, it just doesn't work quite like that. Being around someone doesn't make you something, but it can't hurt. It can't help. There is a decision that has to be made, and it's like that last worship song we sang. I'll say yes, Lord. Where you lead me, I will go. Whatever you say, I say yes. That's a personal decision, and it goes beyond just believing something. It translates into the actions of our lives. Jesus taught them that the greatest among them was the servant. In their culture, the least among them was the servant. So it's very interesting that Jesus would flip what was natural on its head. And he would tell them that in my father's kingdom, it's just the opposite of what you see in the world around you. In my father's kingdom, the greatest is the one who assumes the role of a servant and places the needs of others before themselves. And Jesus set a pretty high standard of service for his followers to live up to right in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. In fact, he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So after shocking his disciples by washing their feet, Jesus then told them, a servant is not greater than his master. And he directed them to do as they saw him do with their own eyes. Follow my example. Follow my pattern that I've shown you and I've taught you over the last three years. You know, the reality is this, that a Christian who does not serve other people, a Christian who does not see their role of greatness in humbling themselves before their fellow man, is a contradiction to their calling. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? True servants of Jesus will always put the needs of other people first. A servant of Christ, a leader in the kingdom of God is the one who serves, right? That's the greatest. The leadership in the kingdom aren't those exempt from serving. They're the ones who understand the art of serving, a servant of Christ feels responsible for helping people learn and grow an intimate relationship with the Lord and, and to feel purposeful, motivational, energized, and to be able to contribute at the highest level of their calling in Christ. You see, in life, life is not about us. And that's really hard because our flesh tells us just the opposite, much like in Jesus' day. When the culture told them that the greatest is the leader and the least is the servant today, our flesh tells us similarly. It tells us that life is about us. It's about number one and preserving ourselves, taking care of you. And if you don't do it, who will? Serving Jesus is about loving people and inspiring them through our actions and our attitudes and our fellowship so that they can experience the greatest offer Christ has for them as well, to say yes to where he leads them and to what he would have them become. I'll throw this on the screen as a takeaway today. We were created for acts of service in God's kingdom. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going to read the scripture, and we're going to leave the scripture on the screen for just a little bit. How important is service to Jesus? How important is our ability to serve mankind? It's so important that God actually created us for acts of service. 
So what does that look like? According to Paul, in his letter to the church of Ephesus, chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 10, Paul says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I'd like to leave that scripture on the screen. If you have your Bible open, just keep that there. And, and I'm going to break that scripture down into three thoughts. The first is this. We are God's workmanship. You see what Paul said there? I want you to repeat something after me. I am a work in progress. <laughs> now, for parents, you understand something about that. Our children are learning and growing. We're shaping and modeling for them who to be and how to fashion their lives and what priorities to place in action, right? What foundations to build their lives upon. They are literally works in progress. But guess what? So are us, right? So are we. We are that work in progress. We are God's workmanship. God is working on you and I. He is working on us. And Paul tells us the reason. God is dealing with us. We are Christians under constant construction, something Chicagoland knows a little bit about, because God isn't done with us yet. You see, if God, if the whole point of life was just being a Christian and going to heaven, then there would be no point of living after we became a Christian. We would just go to heaven. But see, God wants us to become disciples. And disciples are those who pick up their cross daily and follow him regularly. And in doing so, we now carry the love of God all throughout the world, showing the world what true sacrifice is about, what true service and what true love and humility is about. And Paul tells us that we are created as God's workmanship. Never think that you aren't to be a student in the kingdom of God. Never grow to a place where you're no longer a learner. Because the moment we place the level of learning and we limit it because we believe we have arrived, we've placed a ceiling on us. It's that law of the ceiling will never go higher than our ability to learn and serve. Paul says we are God's workmanship. God is always working in our lives to teach us this. Secondly, he says we are created in Christ for what reason? Do you see it? To do good works. That's why we are created in Christ. You see, if you've ever wondered why you're here in this world, Paul answers it right here. Now, I have met many people having, exist I'll, I'll call it an existential crisis, because they aren't willing to accept the scripture as truth. They aren't willing to accept Christ's sacrifice for them as, as salvation, as a means by which they can now have fellowship with God. That God is wanting to do something in their life and that their, mat, their life counts. It's, it's specific. There's a work for their life to do that my life was not meant to do. Theirs is. It's a work God created for them. And I've met people in this existential crisis asking the question, why am I here in the world? What am I supposed to be doing Almost 7 billion people in the world. Why am I needed? And, and they struggle with this. They feel insignificant. They look into the vast cosmos of the known universe. And they realize how insignificant they are. But then when we hear Paul's words of truth, that existential crisis just dissipates and fades because we understand who we are. We are in Christ. And we have been created and planted in Christ for what purpose? Why are we here? We are here to do good works. God created us to serve him and to serve others. He made works and responsibilities, just like he did for Adam and Eve in the garden. That's right. Before the fall, man worked for a living. You see, that's not a result of the fall. That's something God gave him responsibility and fruitfulness with his own hands. And when we get to heaven, guess what? We are going to be kings and priests. We are going to be serving and leaders within the kingdom of God. And to the measure that God can test us as faithful here is to the measure by which he can utilize us in his kingdom. Hmm. That's why the disciples asked Jesus, who is going to be seated at your right hand and who's going to be seated at your left hand? They understood that in his father's kingdom, they would have roles of leadership. But the scripture's not done. Paul said, 
We are God's worksmanship. He created us in Christ to do good works. But look at this last part, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you see that? Please underline that in your Bibles. These good works are very intentional by God in so much as he created them for us to do long before we were ever born. In other words, you're not an accidental. You're not a biological accident. You, you are God's providential cause. He, he destined you to be here. He wants you to know his love for him, and now he wants you to take this love to others, and there are works and gifts that he's placed within you to accomplish the tasks he set before you. And all is he's really looking in his people is that heart that says, yes, Lord. Where you lead me, I will go. Whatever you tell me to, I will do. God is not trying to get us to, what's the word I'm looking for? He's not trying to get us to volunteer in the local church. This is a, a cuss word to me as a pastor. The word volunteer, you might as well just cuss my mother out. Because it's not in the Bible. It's not scriptural. In fact, we use the word to buffer ourselves from personal responsibility. And so when I hear someone say the word volunteer, it is like nails on the chalkboard in school class. It just bothers me to no end. Because God isn't trying to get us to volunteer for anything. We need to take that word and just remove it from our Christian vocabulary because that's not the will of God. He's trying to get us to die to ourself. He's trying to get us to carry our cross for him daily. He's trying to get us to show the world that as we walk through life carrying this cross sacrificially, people will see a servant and humility. You see, he's trying to get us to understand that while our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, the world is lost. And he's wanting us to embrace the call that we would serve the world he's placed us in. And thanks be unto God that we are his workmanship, that we are created in Christ to do good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. God's plan for our life is to become a servant of Jesus. Good works are part of God's plan. Now, they're not the price of salvation. They're not the price that was paid for our salvation, right? But they are proof of our salvation. The believer is not saved as a result of good works. Good works are, in fact, the fruitfulness and the result of our salvation. They're the result of God's working in the believer's heart. They are the evidence that that person, he or she, is alive from the dead and that it is now resurrection power, the Spirit of God dwelling within them. They are the proof of the glorious togetherness that exists between the believer on one hand and the Savior on the other, joining us to the Father. The Lord, when here on earth, lived a life of good works. In fact, in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, with Peter's ministry in the house of Cornelius, he simply summarized Jesus' ministry in a few words. It's hard to believe someone could do that. But he said, Jesus, he went about doing good. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Whatever Jesus did was good and pleasing to the Father. It was purposeful. It was calculated. It was intentional. And it was honoring to the Father. Now, through this indwelling Holy Spirit, God now continues to do good works in our hearts. And that was all part of God's eternal plan to make us in Christ, root us in him, plant us in him, that we would do good works that he prepared for us. Now, if you look at that text again in verse 10, Ephesians 2, 10, he says we are his workmanship. The word workmanship in the original language in the Greek, it actually reads a little differently. The word used there is poema, poema, and that might actually sound similar to an English word. It indicates that we, as God's workmanship, his poema, we are his poem. We are his masterpiece. We are the script, the Magna Carta. 
Each of our lives, we are the canvas on which the master is producing his work of art that will fill this everlasting age with his presence, his love, and his, his desire of salvation for mankind. Maybe you're asking yourself, well, how do I move from being a, a volunteer to being a servant of Jesus? And that's a noble question, and I think it merits a little bit of discussion in the few minutes that we have together. So I want to give you four, four things that we should do if we want to move from volunteerism into servant leadership. Understand, that's what God's trying to do in us. He's not trying to get us to volunteer. He's trying to get us to become servant leaders in the kingdom. So how do we make that transition? Number one, the first thing we have to do is we have to develop a servant mindset. That's what we have to do. We have to develop a servant mentality. What does that look like? The first step is to be, in becoming a successful servant is to take the same mind that Jesus Christ had and embrace it as our thought process. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. He said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? You see, battles are fought, won, and lost first in the mind. If you believe you can't, you won't. If you believe God's word that you are more than a conqueror, you're going to roll up your sleeves and you're going to get dirty. You're going to get into it because you believe in what God's word says to be true. You have to have a mindset, a mentality that trusts what God says, embraces it as truth, and then desires to live it out. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ spent three years reprogramming the mindsets of his disciples. They came with him with carnal natural, sinful minds that had to be transformed by his thinking, by his purposes, by his designs. And their minds were turned from carnal nature into kingdom thinking. Where does that start? Well, for us, it starts with our thought process. We have to make choices. We have to have a mindset of God. In fact, we have to view our world through kingdom principles. We have to see the word of God as the blueprint by which to build our lives upon our marriages or our ministries or our jobs, our careers, our finances, our families. All of those things are to be built by the blueprint of God's word. Now, we have seen a lot of brokenness in this world. When I have opportunity to minister to broken families, and broken marriages, as a pastor, I often ask a single question. I ask them if they believe that what they have was God's true design. Do you believe that what you've built together as husband and wife, do you believe this to reflect God's total best for you? And do you know whether they were Christians or non-believers, they've all answered the same thing. They said, no, I don't believe that what we've created is the best thing that could ever be. That's just honesty. And when we come to that mindset of honesty that says there's more, understanding that there's, there's a potential within us that God wants to develop within us, it starts with the mind. There is so much stinking thinking in his disciples. When Jesus was ministering with them after a long day of ministry, they just needed some, some alone time with Jesus. And they didn't have a kingdom principle at that moment. They were, their flesh was weak. Their spirit was willing, but their flesh was weak. And they just told Jesus, that the, remember the feeding of the 5,000? Get rid of them, Lord. The sun's going down. There's not enough food. We, we can't feed these people. And, and you know what? They're going to end up getting lost or robbed or worse if we keep them out here. There's just no way to address this. So send them home now while there's a chance. <laughs> Sometimes people can be a burden, Right? Sometimes hardships can be a real trial. It takes a mindset of kingdom thinking to understand people aren't problems. People experience problems, and Jesus is their solution. And he wants to use us to simply reveal the plan of God's love to them. There is hope, there is hope, there is hope. Secondly, if we want to move from volunteerism and we want to move to this, this servant leadership role, then number two, we're going to have 
to have a determination within us to serve. Number two, we're going to have to have a determination. There is no good reason for a Christian to be lazy. There is so much work that needs to be done. I'm, I'm disappointed in our current culture because we aren't raising men, boys to become men and ladies to become women. We're confusing kids by our silly social experiments. And if that weren't enough, when they do achieve manhood and womanhood, they're not adults in the sense that we know what adults look like. Let me, let me explain. I don't want to be rude or harsh, but I remember my grandfather's generation. They actually lied about their age to go serve their country, to enlist, to potentially die, to kill fascism, right? To kill, to kill the, the, the regime of this empire. These were men. They were boys, some of them 16 and 17, lying of their age to go serve, there's that word, to be a servant to their nation, to serve, to put their life on the line so others back home could live. Today, we got man boys, right? Grown men in physical bodies, but just play video games and eat Cheetos all day and all night. They, they don't accomplish anything with their lives. Now, if you're unemployed and you're going to take that advantage to catch up on your gaming, I'm not rebuking you for that. I'm talking about a lifestyle. And I, I'm saying that there's no excuse, none, for a Christian to be lazy in this manner. In fact, when we think about it, the Bible tells us that men who won't work to provide for their family, men who won't contribute, men who just kind of sit on their laurels and do nothing about it, oh, he said he is worse than an infidel and denied the faith. Well, that's not a very warm and fuzzy message from the, from the Scripture, is it? But it's truth. We have to have a determination to serve people because people will offend us. I may have offended someone just now. While it's not my intention, sometimes truth cuts us. And if it's not packaged in a way that we want it, sometimes we reject it as a result of the messenger. Sometimes the message could be spot on, but because of the messenger giving it to us, we just reject it altogether. We have to have a determination to not let that happen. Because as we desire to serve people, they will take advantage of us. As we desire to love people, they will be unlovely to us. When we desire to forgive those who hurt us, they will hit the other cheek because it's just there. We have to have a determination. It's not enough to just have a servant's mentality, to know academically what we ought to do. We must be determined to serve. We must be determined to help. Serving others, it isn't always fun. It isn't always easy. It isn't always glamorous. And it certainly isn't always convenient. But people who choose not to serve are truly selfish in that they are violating the very Christian tenet of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so whether that cuts one way or the other as it's spoken, I hope that you will allow God to give us a, a servant mindset and a servant determination because it's one thing to go gung-ho and then, you know, Sister Sandpaper rubs you the wrong way when you walk into church. And you're like, well, that's the last time I'm going to do that. That's the last time I'm going to ever help. That's, if they're going to criticize my efforts, hey, think of what they did to Jesus. You got off easy. Right? Just how important is this notion of serving? Well, the half-brother of Jesus, his name was James, he said it this way. It's recorded for us in James chapter 2, verse 26. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead. Think about that. A body without a spirit, obviously it's dead. And he says, that's the picture I'm showing you of someone who calls themselves a Christian or a believer or a disciple and yet is not fulfilling God's calling in their life to do the good works he prepared in advance for them to do. James outlines the significance that good works play within the life of the born-again disciple of Christ. I want to read it. It's verses 14 through 19 in chapter 2. James says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? 
Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you would say to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. You see, faith is not a mental belief. Faith is not some cognitive assent. Faith supersedes all of what we defined it as. Our mindset what we believe is supposed to change our behavior and our conduct and our steps that we take, our behavior. And when this happens, our mind and our hands are both serving God wholeheartedly. And doing so, we will find ourselves serving God's people. Number three, if we want to move from volunteerism to true servanthood, we're going to have to commit to following God. We're going to have to commit to following God. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I really addressed this in our first week. But there is a difference between someone who speaks and confesses their sins or Christ is Savior and someone who then lives like it. It's one thing to believe something. It's quite another thing to be something. And so we have to commit to following God. Jesus was not giving a cute illustration when he said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now we see the genius comparison he gave to fishermen. Well, they've been casting their nets, catching fish. Fish, eh, everybody knows what a fish is. But now God's going to use me to bring a harvest of people? That's a whole other horse of a different color. It takes commitment. It wasn't just a thought it wasn't just an analogy. It wasn't just a suggestion. It is the commission of the church. Number four, if we're going to move from volunteerism to servanthood, we're going to have to start right where we are. Serve where God plants you. Many people in my life I have witnessed, they, they're, they're waiting for the stars to align or an angel from heaven to walk and interrupt their prayer meeting and to tell them this latest message straight from the throne of God the Father right to you in Mundelein before they're actually going to commit to serve. Please, don't humiliate the Scripture in this way. Don't wait for some epiphany. Simply look for a need and fill it. See where the hole is and plug it. You see, there's different types of ministry. There's ministry where our giftings really, they just totally are magnified in that element, right? It's like that basketball coach that, that, that played his whole life and is so dynamic and so good at communicating and, and, and has such a charismatic personality and has such a passion to bring the best out of people. That's, that's a gift that has been honed within him over years. But guess what? If there's an old lady struggling to get her groceries out of the car as he's walking into the store, wouldn't it be wonderful if he just realized that some of the gifts that we have, well, I'm a coach. So he looks around and he says, hey, you over there, I want you to come over here and pick up this bag. You over there, I want you to come pick up this bag. We're going to come around here. We're going to come by the back. We're going to come bring it right in the trunk because he's a coach. That's his gift. Or he can just pick up the bag and he can do it. See, many times we mystify what's right in front of us. And we think that our gifts are somehow, uh, the service that we're being asked to do is somehow beneath the giftings that God has placed with us. And I say hogwash. Hogwash. Jesus taught us that's not true. When we had that last supper, Jesus and his disciples, had them prepare the room. Remember, this wasn't like a willy-nilly kind of thing. He sent them ahead to prepare for that Passover meal. There was preparation that had to be done, but the one thing they were unwilling to do, because remember in their culture, there's leaders and there's servers. 
Leaders are good, servers are weak. And so at the, it was the mindset of their culture. And so when it came time for the dinner, it became very apparent that none of the disciples took the time to prepare a servant at the door to wash the feet as people came as a sign of hospitality into the home. That was a requirement. That was part of the culture. But none of them thought of it, and certainly none of them were willing to do it. Because you know what? They had important gifts. They were going to, they didn't know it quite yet, but their names are going to be on the foundations of heaven. Wow, that's important. But you know what they thought? They thought they were too important to take on the role of a servant. Jesus, he put that towel around his waist. He girded his loin, and he knelt before the disciples. He took the wash basin, and he washed their feet, and he went around the circle, and he did this to them. And then he said, no servant is greater than his master. Do what you've seen me do. So before we think for a moment that service is somehow beneath us or a waste of our time, we have actually placed a ceiling over our effectiveness. And there's a reason why we plateau, because we have the wrong mindset. We have the wrong determination. We have the wrong heart, and we have the wrong execution. Would you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, I thank you for your word and the example of Jesus, the living word, God made flesh to make his dwelling among us. I thank you, Father, that you spent time loving compassionately and patiently teaching your disciples and your people just how important of a role it is to be committed to you and what that commitment really translates into with our lives. I thank you. And I thank you that while you call us to be servants and therefore the greatest in the world, I thank you even more that you make it possible. I thank you, Jesus, that this is not beyond our reach. This is You're not asking us to do something that we're not capable of doing. You showed us the way. I pray, Lord, that you would help us have the same mind that Christ had. And that we would take the teachings of our culture. We would take the influences that so, that so bombard our thought process and influence our outcomes, and we lay that at the cross. We bring to you our carnal man, our carnal nature, and we want to exchange it for the mind of Christ. That we would begin this beautiful walk of service with the right servant mentality. And I pray, Lord, that you would birth a flame within each heart, a determination to be a part of the work of the kingdom of God. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to challenge every believer, those who call themselves Christians, to embrace the real call of becoming a disciple and therefore follow God in their lives. And then Jesus, I pray that you would help us not become so spiritually minded that we are no earthly good, and you would help us understand that we are to, we are to serve wherever the need is, wherever we are. We are still servants, whether we are on the clock or whether we are at church or we are at home or on vacation. We are servants of the king. This morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to challenge you this morning. Today, if you have never received Christ as your savior, see, that's where this journey begins. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ. He wants to give you his self. He wants to invest in you his spirit and make you alive, not just a good person. You see, Jesus didn't come to make us just good sinners, nicer sinners. See, that's what the flesh does. We just try to fix the things on the surface because we can't fix the thing in the heart. So we talk about actions and behaviors and conduct, and that's all good. But the reality is, Jesus wants to give you a new spirit. He wants to give you new life, and that which is dead Maybe you have no forgiveness in your heart for those who hurt you. He wants to make that alive. Maybe you have no patience for certain people. God wants to make that new. And he does this 
by allowing the Holy Spirit to take residence in your life. Today, if you'd like to receive that, there's a process of repentance. All of us do it. Today, I want to pray a prayer of repentance, and I'm going to ask you to join with me, whether you're here receiving this by faith or you're watching online and you're going to accept this as your commitment to serve God with your life. It begins with a simple prayer of repentance to say yes. Yes, Lord. I say yes. Why don't you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for loving me so passionately. And thank you for dying in my place. For all of my sin, you took upon yourself. You bore it on the cross so that I can be in right standing with your Father. I can't even imagine what that cost you. But today I humble myself. I confess I am that sinner, that you bore my sin. And I receive your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. Cover me. Cover my shame. Cover my failure. And give me your mind. Heal my mind. Let my old man perish. Let me leave my nets on the shore, whatever those could be, and help me follow you with my life. Help me be the greatest through becoming the least. Give me the heart of a servant to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord thanks and praise. Hallelujah. My friends, whether you prayed that prayer for the first time or you renewed yourself for the thousandth time, I want you to know something very powerful happens when God's people come into alignment with the will of God with the Spirit of God, with the direction of God, and that is there's fruitfulness. You see, it's one thing to be faithful. Jesus took his disciples and they saw a fig tree. And it wasn't bearing fruit. And then he, he came back and they saw that same fig tree and it was dead just, just moments later, days later. And they were surprised and said, wow, we just saw this thing. It was perfectly healthy. The truth of the matter was Jesus taught them a lesson. It really wasn't healthy. It was alive. It was faithful. It showed up every day. It made nests for birds. It made leaves. It provided shade, but it didn't do what it was created to do, bear fruit. You see, when we have the Spirit of God in us, it's not to just plateau in status quo. It's to bear fruit for the kingdom. So, Father, I pray that you would light a fire in your people to be a church without walls, as we live our lives, that we would be sermons, epistles with feet, that our lives would be read through the intentions of mankind, and that they would see Jesus in us. They would see love in us, forgiveness in us, compassion in us, the fruits of the Spirit growing in our lives, and that we would be in season, bearing fruit for your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today for our online service, and I hope that you will allow the Lord to continually show you areas of service. If this is something that's on your heart, and you feel God is pressing you to take that step of commitment to serve, then I want you to follow up with me. I want you to reach to me, call the office, send me the email, follow me on a Sunday, connect with me, and I'll give you opportunity to take your hands and to help someone in need. For when we've done that, Jesus said we've truly blessed him. Whether we give a cup of cold water in his name or visit a prisoner in prison or clothe the naked, Jesus said whatever you did unto the least of these, you've done unto me. How rewarding it is to know that we have served our Lord rightly. So God bless you in Jesus' name.